Hi everyone, welcome to another Doug's Lab video. In this video, I'll be performing what's known as the haliform reaction to produce chloroform. I'll be using chloroform in a lot of upcoming videos as a solvent, and it's pretty important because it's a good replacement for dichloromethane in a lot of reactions, which is also something that is maybe expensive or a little difficult to get. So I'll be demonstrating how to produce chloroform. We'll be producing chloroform using what's known as the haliform reaction. Haliform reaction involves a methyl ketone, so a ketone that has a methyl group directly adjacent to it, um, this could be any number of things, so this will work with many ketones, but the, the rule is that it has to be a methyl ketone, reacts with a hypohalite ion, three of them in fact, and the X of course is a halogen, which is uh, you know, fluorine, chlorine, iodine, bromine. Um, this doesn't work with fluorine, however, because the hypofluorite ion is not known to exist, I believe, so you can use this practically with uh, iodine, bromine, and also chlorine. Anyway, the ketone the methyl group breaks off the ketone and you end up with a hydroxyl group in its place, so it forms the corresponding carboxylic acid, and then you're left with the trihalomethane. In this case, we'll be producing trichloromethane, which is chloroform. And uh, well, our methyl ketone that we'll start with is going to be acetone, so dimethyl ketone represented here. We're going to end up with, the, of course, the carboxylic acid. We'll use sodium hypochlorite as the, as the, um, halo, or the hypohalite ion and we'll end up with chloroform. So, let's get started. So to make the amount of chloroform that's required for the upcoming videos, I'm going to run this synthesis on a fairly large scale. The highest concentration of sodium hypochlorite I can buy commercially is this 10% pool sanitizer, which is actually a pretty good deal since it's $12 for a pack of four gallons. Um, I'm saving the fourth gallon for another video, but we're gonna use these three to make the chloroform. Um, turns out that uh, I need about 130 milliliters of acetone for each gallon of sodium hypochlorite. But uh, you don't want to add it all at once because the reaction is extremely exothermic and it will bring this whole gallon to a boil. So what I've done is I've soaked these in the freezer overnight and I've measured out three separate uh, 65 milliliter portions of acetone which we'll use to add so we can get the full 130 milliliters in two different additions, so we can soak it in the freezer between additions. So I'm going to go get my thermometer so we can tell what the temperature of this is and what it comes to when we add the acetone. So using this thermometer probe, you can see that this gallon of 10% sodium hypochlorite though it's still liquid, is at about minus 16 Celsius. I'm now going to add the first 65 milliliter portion of acetone, close and shake, and we'll remeasure the temperature and see how high the temperature becomes. A one-half portion of acetone has now been added to all three one-gallon jugs. The reaction will not proceed at an appreciable rate until these jugs warm up a little bit, so you leave them out for a little while, maybe 20 minutes or so, and then we'll stick them back in the freezer and we can add the second portion of acetone. You'll be able to tell when, it, when the reaction proceeds because these jugs will actually get quite warm. You can see now that the reaction is proceeding well in the first gallon by this band here that's missing frost. Right here you can see the frost line stops and then starts up again somewhere down there. So right in the middle is where this reaction is happening. These, the addition was carried out perhaps two or three minutes later, and notice that they're both completely covered in frost, whereas this one is rapidly melting. This is now approximately 10 minutes into the reaction, and you can clearly see that the frost is rapidly melting off of all these jugs. And this jug here, the first edition, has absolutely no frost on it at all. So we'll take another temperature reading. And we find that this jug is at 11C and climbing. So we've gone from minus 16 to plus 12 in just about 10 minutes. Considering water has a very high specific heat capacity, that's quite a lot of energy released. So we'll give this another 10 minutes and then we'll stick these all back in the freezer in preparation for the second edition of acetone. The jugs have been in the freezer for approximately an hour, and we'll check their temperature now. It looks as if they've cooled off to approximately 
three degrees. That should be sufficient. So now we'll add the other half of the 65 milliliters of acetone. Give it a good shake, and let it come back through the temperature. We're always losing the cap when you're doing this because these solutions warm up and they'll become pressurized if you don't. A good indicator that the reaction is nearing completion is the disappearance of the green color of the hypochlorite. So when these come back up to room temperature and the acetone is finished reacting with the, with the sodium hypochlorite, this green color will have disappeared and that'll signal the end point of the reaction. Well the jug has gotten considerably warmer, it's nearly room temperature now, and uh, just about three minutes ago was when the last addition of acetone occurred. And if you look inside, notice that green color has completely disappeared. That means that our reaction has happened. Now I'll take a quick look at the temperature here. Let's turn on the thermometer here. And here's the probe. We'll stick this probe into the solution. Notice we went from about 3 Celsius to, well, 24 Celsius in climbing, just with that addition of 65 milliliters of acetone. So that's a pretty significant temperature increase. It's a very, very exothermic reaction. So now what we're going to do is wait for the chloroform to settle out. The reaction produces chloroform, and chloroform is heavier than water. And since this is most, mostly water, with a little bit of salt in it now, um, and all the other impurities that were in the bleach, of course, the chloroform is going to end up settling to the bottom of the jug. Now I've prepared in a small example here. This is a jug of water with a little bit of chloroform in it. And if I tilt the jug, it's not leaking, it was just wet on the bottom, um, you might be able to see that little layer of chloroform in the bottom. See how it moves around? Now that was a, that's a very small amount of chloroform, that's maybe 10 milliliters in there inside a one gallon jug, but the premise is the same. There's going to be a lot of chloroform in the bottom of all these jugs, and essentially we're going to wait for the chloroform to settle out over the course of about an hour, at which point I'm going to decant most of the liquid off the top, leaving maybe... 300 milliliters of liquid in the bottom and the chloroform and then we can pour all of it into a separatory funnel or a larger glass vessel where we continue the separation. It has now been about an hour since the reaction has completed and the containers are all at room temperature and all there is left to do now is to recover the chloroform that's on the bottom. So basically we're just going to carefully decant each jug into a glass container. This just happens to be a large glass container that I have. And check the bottom by tilting it for any sign of chloroform. And you can see there's none there. So we can go ahead and discard this. You're going to want to do this in a ventilated room because chloroform is a bit soluble in water. I think it's about uh, 0.8 grams per 100 milliliters, or about 80 grams per liter. So, or sorry, about 8 grams per liter. So a bit of chloroform is given off into the air as you do this. So it's a good idea, just for safety's sake, to keep good ventilation in the room. So we've taken almost two liters out, and now we're no chloroform yet. Chloroform is an environmental toxin. It is produced by some plants, so it's not too bad for the environment, but definitely pour off the uh, this water that you're taking out uh, into a drain where water goes to a treatment plant and not just into a river or something. No chloroform. And the last 
glass of the jug. And I can already see it. See in the bottom, all those little beads? They'll all eventually coalesce into a good amount of chloroform. So that's what it looks like. Anyway, we'll just decant off this top layer as best we can without losing any of the bottom, and we'll store the bottom temporarily in a small bottle. So after the decantation process, I managed to recover about 300 milliliters of raw chloroform with this layer of water on top. Now we'll simply set up for simple distillation and we'll use a separatory funnel to take this water layer off and distill the chloroform to remove any impurities it may have picked up from the bleach before drying and storing. Something like that. And you can see that the chloroform has collected in the bottom and in the top we have mostly water. So with the removal of the funnel, we'll now begin to drain the chloroform off into the bottom container just like that. So here is the raw chloroform. It is about 300 milliliters. It's wet and it has some contaminants. So I've set up here for simple distillation and we will just uh, run this chloroform through really quick and we'll be able to have we'll recover some high purity but maybe still a little bit wet chloroform So the distillation is progressing nicely. I added some other chloroform that I had before that I wanted to redistill just to make sure it didn't contain any phosgene. It's very old and I plan on using it in this coming reaction, so that's why it looks like there's more in there than there was. I think there's about 450 milliliters of, chlor of chloroform total in this whole setup. And as you can see, it's boiling out of here. And the gases are coming up. Chloroform boils at about 61C. We haven't quite reached that, but again, uh, that's, that could be an effect of uh, atmospheric pressure as well. And you can see we have it condensing very nicely here in this condenser, rather rapidly, in fact. But it is completely condensing. There is no vapor front past right about here, you see. And we're dripping it very quickly into this flask. So the distillation is nearing completion, and you can see all of the garbage that we've distilled out of the chloroform here on the wall of the flask. Now normally you would never distill the dryness because you could crack your flask from the heat and also you end up driving some of your impurities over. However, there isn't anything in here that is going to come over at a higher temperature other than maybe chlorobutanol or something, but this is only at 60 Celsius, so even very gentle heating, uh, very non-glass breaking type heating, is uh, going to drive the rest of this chloroform off. So this time I am going to distill the dryness, although in practice you really should never do it. Um, Everything's come over at about, at about 60 C. It's so uh, that indicates that the chloroform that's come off is actually quite pure. We have over here the nice clear flask of chloroform with its characteristic high refractive index and uh, its sort of heavy and solvent look to it. Um, this chloroform undoubtedly contains some water. Originally, when it was distilling over, there was some water in it and it appeared cloudy. However, that cleared up with uh, as more chloroform came over. Um, there is water in the chloroform, so for water-free applications, of course, you can't use this, but if you're running a reaction that requires water-free conditions, you're generally going to dry your solvents prior to the reaction anyway. So for my purposes, this chloroform is good enough to use for most things, so all I'm going to do now is just transfer it to this amber glass bottle once the distillation wraps up. 
So I believe the theoretical yield for this whole process is right around 450 milliliters based on the hypochlorite used. Um, but of course, we only managed to get about 300 milliliters out of the initial run, which corresponds to somewhere around a 66-ish percent yield, which isn't bad considering that um, about 60 milliliters, uh, or yeah, about 60 milliliters of chloroform is left in the water that you discard off the top of the chloroform because chloroform is slightly soluble in water. So you lose some there. I actually tried salting the chloroform out of the water a few times with a few different types of salts, but in the end, really what happens is you end up spending much more money on the salt to get that little bit of chloroform out of the water than you would if you could just buy another bottle of bleach and make more chloroform. So it really didn't end up being worth it. So 66% yield is about what I can get using the 10% hypochlorite. And that yields me about 300 milliliters of chloroform. So about 100 milliliters of chloroform per gallon of hypochlorite that I buy. So there's the chloroform. The level's right about there. That is one full bottle of chloroform ready for use. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, subscribe, like, and comment.